this is, there's something really exciting about the, um, worshiping outside together, isn't there? You say amen. Amen. Oh, it's beautiful. I mean, when I knew this uh, tropical storm was coming this direction this week, I wasn't sure what it would be like, but it is just a gorgeous day God has given us, reminding us again that he's our creator, that he's compassionate, that he's good, that he's loving, that he's kind. Um, he cares about creation, which means he cares about us. Um, I'd like you just to look around, and we're not going to shake hands this morning, but just wave at someone. Just wave at someone, say good morning. Um, we've got some folks with us who are visiting, and it's wonderful to have you with us. We are going to worship together. We're going to hear the word together. We're going to celebrate Christ's presence together. Uh, Jonathan... Um, Keener is here and will be leading us in a few moments. Those of you who know Jonathan's background know that he is a professionally trained pianist, musician, and it's always a blessing to have him leading us. And um, Heidi is not here. She woke up this morning. She's been having some eye issues, woke up this morning with a swollen cheek and, uh, and um, uh, pain in her cheek and her uh, eye, so we're going to keep our eye on that. Um, the offering this morning is in the back in the uh, feet washing bucket. There's no water in it, but drop your money in there or whatever you've got. Uh, we're going to take the offering that way this morning. And the adult Sunday school class books are here. If you're interested in picking those up, they came in, um, and Paul has placed them over there for you. Any other announcements that I'm missing? Anyone? Well, good. Let's pray together. Uh, we know Jesus is already here. We just want to thank him for being here. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful for your presence with us. We thank you that as we gather, we gather without shame, without condemnation, that we are your children. We are deeply loved by you. We thank you that you so love the world and so love it still, which means you love each one of us. This morning as we gather outside, we just pray that we would give witness to the goodness and faithfulness of who you are. Thank you for all those who've gathered this morning. We just pray um, together that we would um, experience, again, your love, your grace, whatever it is that we came with, is most deeply in our hearts this morning that needs to be touched by you. We just ask that you would touch us in that place um, and bring healing, bring life, bring restoration, bring joy, bring hope, bring courage, bring confidence, bring your peace. And we pray for those who are not here with us but that are one of us and those who are not here but that will someday be one of us. We just commit them to you this morning asking that the grace and peace of Christ would be theirs and that they would, those who don't know you would awaken to the life that you have and the life that you bring. And so we commit this morning into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. I think that means you're up, Jonathan. I just heard a bell. Oh, that was a, I'll take his phone. Good morning, everyone. If you don't have a song sheet uh, and would like one, they're up here on the, uh, there's a wagon over here. Um, we do have a new song today, so you might want one of those. Let's stand together if you're able. And we'll sing um, of God who is mighty to save. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow. Everything I believe in, now I surrender. I surrender. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to 
first two songs we sang a lot about uh, proclaiming. The first, the first song, shine your light and let the whole world see. And then this one, shout to the north and the south. And why do we proclaim? Why are we, why are we sent to be ministers to the world around us? Because Jesus was sent. Um, Jesus said in, in, uh, in his prayer in John 17 that um, as God sent Jesus, he is sending us. Um, so in the next couple songs, I want to focus on our response to, to God sending Jesus to us. Um, this, this next one is probably new to most of you. It's been a favorite of our families recently. Um, and what I like is that all these verses talk about our response, so that we come, that we can come to, um, to Jesus when we need help, if we, are, if we thirst, if we are weak, if we fear. But then finally, in the last verse, Jesus comes to us when we when we are not seeking Him when we are um, when we are lost 
that uh, Jesus comes to us. So this, and, and the last song, just uh, let's, let's think about our response. Because Jesus came to us, we can come to him. Um, no matter what we've been through, that, uh, that we can come we can come to um, we can come to Jesus. for the 
the hopeless and all those who stray. Come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can cure. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face, O oh, wanderer. too far. So lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are, come as you are, fall in his arms, come as you are. First, I want to apologize to Claire, who is also professionally trained and just as good as Jonathan, and I'm sorry about that. I, didn't, I missed that they were leading together. Thank you, both of you. I was to announce that while we're having worship, you were to put your offering, if you have one that you want to place, in the bucket. And so I'm going to ask you, this was such a beautiful song, um, Jesus Strong and Kind. Where did you find that? Um, where did did find you write it? it? What? No, no, is that a... There's church in Virginia. Isn't that a beautiful song? I was so touched by that song. Um, and so I'd love you to, if you'd just sing through that again. And if you have an offering, just go back and put it in the uh, feet washing bucket back there. Um, and I also, Claire and Jonathan, just want to take this time to really commend you. Jonathan, your sermon a couple of weeks ago, your worship, both of you, the way you're leading this morning, God has been up to good in your lives. Um, that's evident. And there's, there's fruit being produced in you, and we just want to affirm that. And thank you for being faithful in the midst of, I'm sure, times that we didn't know about, but uh, you were faithful, and it's, it's showing. We appreciate that. Thank you.
Thank you, Paul, and good morning. I greet you in Jesus' name. Are you able to hear in the back? Awesome. Um, I want to thank the team who um, has worked really, really hard to move us from the sanctuary that was pretty straightforward. You weren't there, but otherwise it was pretty straightforward. Um, we could stream there. We had all the equipment there. And it is no small feat to do what we're doing down here for our team. And so could we just give them a round of applause? It's led by Kate, but a lot of others who work with her. And just say thank you for, um, I just want to say thank you um, for making this effort to do uh, what we're doing this morning. And, and we couldn't do it without you. And we're really grateful. This morning's message is entitled something like exactly where God wants us to be, no longer inside looking out and no longer outside looking in. Exactly where God wants us to be, no longer outside looking inside looking out or outside looking in. As much as I like, and I do very much, our new multi-purpose space and our newly renovated sanctuary, there is something that I and probably you are really enjoying about gathering together outside as God's people. There are a number of reasons for that. I think it's clear to us as we gather outside that we're not a people who are defined by the walls of our building. When we're outside, it's clear that there's no defining us by our walls. I love the fact that we can give public witness outside to who Jesus is and what Jesus means to us. There are also fewer obvious barriers um, I've told this story before, but a number of years ago when a neighbor passed away um, and we knew that the only contacts he had were at the Moose Building, which has now been sold on the square, um, I walked up to the Moose Building and um, the, I needed to talk to someone to, to get information and to give information, and uh, the door had a big sign on it that said, Members Only. And um, it was with a little fear and trepidation that I knocked on the door and I was warmly greeted inside. But I thought, you know, that's a way an awful lot of people must feel when they come to church for the first time or don't come to church for the first time, that this looks like a members-only kind of place. But when we're out in the park together, it doesn't look like members-only, right? 
I mean, anyone. The walls are gone. Anyone can come and go. You don't need uh, to RSVP. You don't need reservations. You don't need tickets. There's no calling ahead. Walk-ins are welcome, right? I mean, I love that idea that, and last week it happened. Um, Phil uh, walked in and joined us and had a word for us. I've also, for years, Heidi and I've taught that we would love to see the walls between community and church and this kind of us-them come down, that the, the, there be fewer distinctions between who we are as church and who the community is, that we are community together. We are the community, and we are in the community. And again, this kind of event reminds us that that's really the truth, and I think helps us with that. I think being in our park, that. Um, our borough park reminds us that we are, and we're going to look at Luke 10 in a few moments, but we are being hosted by our community. It's so easy, easy to think that we are the hosts and we're taking care of the community, but in fact it's the other way around. We need this community. We need what this community has to give. We are being hosted by them graciously, and I think being outside reminds us of that and perhaps gives us greater gratitude for their hospitality. I'm also struck by the fact that we wouldn't be out here this morning if God hadn't moved us out of the building. We wouldn't be here this morning. We'd be there, which will be fine when we're there. But in the meantime, I think there might be some lessons that God wants us to discover that we take back with us when we go in there. Can we say amen? amen. Every opportunity we have that changes things up and turns things upside down is an opportunity to learn. I tell my students right now, as a sociology students, this is the richest time a sociologist can imagine to understand or to be looking at human culture and society. We are able to ask questions now that we didn't even know were questions a year ago. We didn't even know there could be such a question. You know, the whole question of masks. I missed, uh, we're supposed to wear masks all the time on campus, and I walked in the BSC in a hurry and forgot my mask, and someone looked at me, and I quickly put my face in my shirt. But then I go other places, and people look at me strange because I have a mask on, right? So what's up with that? I mean, there are questions from our perspective, sociological perspective that are terribly interesting that we didn't even think of a year ago. But I think it's also true for us as followers of Jesus. There are things Jesus can reveal to us in a moment like this that we were not as open to hearing or listening or even thinking about a year ago. They weren't even on our radar screen. And so this is not a wasted time. My mom has always said, no experience is wasted. Jesus always uses it to teach us. I've been saying all through this time that God's spirit is to blame for this crisis. Some folks don't really like the way I put that. But I, what I mean is that God is behind this, that God was not taken surprised by this. That this is not a detour on our way to the new heaven and earth. This is the most direct route. You know when you put in your GPS, the most direct route? Well, you know, if we a year ago had put in the, the highway to heaven, the most direct route, we wouldn't have said COVID is going to get us there. We would have said, this is a big interruption, God, to where we think we're headed. But in God's map, this isn't an interruption. This is exactly where God has us and where God wants us to be going. And so the question for us is, how do we pay attention to where we're at on that map? How do we make sure that we don't misstep in the midst of this time? And I'm not anxious about the misstep, because God who directed us is going to bring us back if we do misstep. But I just want us to pay attention to the moment we're in. And so when I say that we're no longer on the out, inside looking out, that's clear. But when I say we're no, longer on, but we're no longer on the outside looking in, what I'm saying is let's not just anticipate the day when we get back in the building. Let's not just say I can't wait till we get back there, but say what is God teaching us here? And maybe some of you are saying I don't want to go back there. I don't know. But what is God saying to us in this moment? I'd like to read Luke 10, a few verses. I'm largely going to share from verses 1 to 6. And uh, if you have your Bible, great, you can turn to it, but if not, I'm going to read it. Luke 10, 1 to um, uh, probably 7, uh, 1 to 12. And this is a, for, for many a familiar verse, but uh, scripture, but I think it's different read in this context we're in now than it was a year ago. And so what do you hear in this passage? In fact, I'm going to open it up a little bit. Um, to say to you, we're, I'm going to read the passage twice and just say, from where you're at, is there something you heard you'd like to share from this passage? Something maybe that spoke to you differently hearing the Katie Dids down here in the park. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place he was about to go to. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. 
Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, say, Peace. And that word peace is a Jewish Hebrew word that means shalom. It means God's reign, God's order, God's kingdom. Peace to this house. If a man or person of peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves their wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcome, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet we wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. I tell you it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom and for that town. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. He asked the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say peace to this house. If a person of peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves their wages. Do not move from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcome, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet we wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. All right, from where you're at, what did you hear this morning, maybe? And maybe it's something you've heard before, but what is, what's happening in this passage that you heard this morning? Anyone? We're positioned for the harvest. Who said that? Thank you, Nikki. We are positioned for the harvest. We are more positioned for the harvest in the park than we are in the building, right? That's just the reality. We are more positioned here because we're outside of here. We're outside of here. I've worked with congregations and we tried to get them into the mission of God and they could never get out of the parking lot. To do the mission of God seriously, you've got to get off the property at some point or another. Someone else. Okay, when we enter others' lives, we first say peace. What might that look like, John, to say peace? What, what might a peace look like that we say to someone other than peace? Is there anything else that it might look like? Uh, caring, service. Okay. Caring, service, anything that looks like the kingdom of God, right? So this could be verbal. It could be saying peace to someone, but it could be anything that speaks of the incredible abundance of the kingdom of God, of the goodness of the kingdom of God. Someone else, what do you hear? They were not the silent of the land. They were not the silent of the land. Thank you, Fred. They spoke up. They were bold. They were sent. They were not the silent in the land. Thank you, Fred. Anyone else? I'm sorry? Okay. Wonderful. Thank you, Rosita. They did not try to argue. They either were, they either were accepted as people of peace by people of peace, or they took their peace and left. But they didn't stand in the square arguing about the kingdom of God. There was work to be done, and there were people who were waiting for that word of peace. Don't, I mean, maybe that's even related, Rosita, to his word, don't look at someone on the way down the street. Just keep going. Get to that house of peace. Anyone else? This is wonderful. Anyone else a thought? Let's look at this passage again, and thank you for all who have shared. In Luke 10, we see a size of people, a group of people that Jesus gathered together not to be gathered, 
They weren't gathered together to gather. They were gathered together to be sent. It's why we exist. We exist for the sake of the world that God so loved and so loved still. We do not exist for ourselves. We exist for God's, for this world that God so loved. We are gathered this morning into God's mission. I love what I'm hearing from a number of you about what Jeff and Kendra shared, about little missional communities that could start in our own homes in the way that they have operated theirs with neighbors and friends. And we gather as a whole to share those stories and be encouraged to go back into those little communities to share God's love. When we go back inside that building, let's remember that our gathering together on Sunday or whenever it is, is not the end. It's the means to the end. It's not the end of who we are and who God is, but it's the means to the end, of for, which is the mission of God. We see also in this chapter that Jesus needed the collaboration of his, of his disciples. I mean, here is the Son of God come to earth who feels the need to gather 72 other people around him. He's not doing this on his own. And this, again, it reflects what we have tried to work out in this congregation and you have responded so well to, that we are all member, we are all ministers. We are all ministers. This idea of a ministry pipeline where we are all engaged in, in ministry in some way or another in the congregation, in the community. That this is a, I mean, Jesus would not have said to his disciples when he left to go into the mission if he thought it could have been carried out by God alone. God requires us to be engaged in this mission with him to the world that he so loved. One of the things that's most interesting to me and is true in our congregation is that those who most recently found Jesus are those who are usually most anxious to go on with the mission of God. They are often those who know people who don't know Jesus more than the rest of us who've been churched much of our lives. Somehow we who've been churchified are the ones who've forgotten that there's so much joy in this gospel. There's so much joy in singing that beautiful, beautiful song that Jesus comes to me, that when I am lost, Jesus comes to me. I need to hear that. I need to hear that every day of my life. I need to hear that throughout the day of my life, that when I am lost, Jesus comes to me. And so this is a second point that I hope we remember when we go back inside, that Jesus asks us to be part of this mission because he needs us to be part of this mission. And the sad part of this, of this chapter is that he says there are just too many of us, too few of us with interest in the mission. The harvest, harvesters are just too few, he says. The, the, the capacity for the mission of God is so great, but those who are interested in showing up at the harvest field to harvest in the morning are so few. And you can hear his heart breaking and grieving because of that. And I say that not to add guilt to you or to me. Jesus wasn't saying that, I think, for guilt. He was saying it out of grief. We have so guilted ourselves that we should be doing this mission that we stop doing it because we're so, we feel so guilty that we're not doing it. Let's not see this as a guilt trip. Let's, not see this as, let's see this as an invitation to this community around us and to those we love that, that there is good news that Jesus invites us to be part of. Which brings us to another thing that I hope we remember when we go inside. That it's harvest time. That we might be inside, but it is harvest time. Jesus says it. He says the harvest is plentiful. Heidi and I went back to uh, Belleville yesterday, where we love to go home. And um, frankly, we went home to buy vegetables. I'm sorry for those of you who love your vegetables from Lancaster County, but we grew up in God's country, where the vegetables are bigger and they're certainly cheaper. Um, I bought five peaches, five tomatoes, and uh, a dozen ears of corn or so, a little more than that for 20 bucks this week in Lancaster. And I said to Heidi, we're going to Belleville this weekend. This is ridiculous. <laughs> so we bought several half bushels of tomatoes for $8 rather than five tomatoes for $10. That's what I paid. Five tomatoes for $10 at an Amish stand. Anyway. So we went to Mountainside Produce, our little place, little, the place we love up the valley. We turned the corner and we saw loads and loads of tomatoes. Green beans, cucumbers, peppers, on and on, we filled up the truck. We love going to Belleville. And then we went to Swarry's and we got some peaches, although they don't have as many down, up there as down here either. And we got some apples that were in, that, that were in season. 
We love going there and getting what we need and coming home and harvesting it together. But think how disappointed we would have been, and we stayed with mom and dad overnight too, uh, which was wonderful, uh, and had dinner and breakfast with them. But how disappointed we would have been had we driven up to Allensville, down the lane of the mountainside farm, and found the baskets turned upside down. The baskets upside down, the shelves completely bare, and nobody around. And then we looked out at the fields that yesterday morning, we saw the tomato vines were breaking with fresh tomatoes that were rotting, and cucumbers were rotting, and beans were rotting, because no one had bothered to pick them. The melons were split open on the ground. It makes me kind of sick just thinking about the loss of that. But that's what Jesus is saying to us when he says, I see a harvest field that no one is harvesting. It is, a pro it, it is produce going to waste. There are people who are, and this is again why I love this song, Jonathan Clare, there are people who are hungry and thirsty for what you and I have, and we are not with them. And their lives are rotting on the vine. That is not a judgment statement. It is a statement of truth that they themselves would acknowledge. That they are lost, that they are broken. There is a harvest field, folks, at your workplace. There is a harvest field in your neighborhood. There is a harvest field in your extended family. There is a harvest field around here. I think when I have thought, grown up thinking about the harvest field, I've thought about it as that place that was the last place I wanted to go because it somehow meant doing, I mean, I'm an introvert by nature. So I joined a little group that went door to door in Belleville um, handing out tracts. I was the only kid who did this and I think people thought, oh, this is, this is really great, this kid's going. What they didn't know was mostly guilt that was driving me. I hated it. I hated going up the door and saying, these are the four spiritual laws. Like, how did we make grace about law? But anyway, that's another point. I don't like it. I, I thought of the harvest field as something that, again, I had to do. But I love going into a harvest field of vegetables, right? I love going and picking stuff that's overflowing. That's the image Jesus has. This is a harvest field that he says is ripe for the picking. That there are people in our community, in our families, neighborhoods, and workplaces who are lost inside. Broken, traumatized, anxious, depressed angry, incarcerated, hungry, crying, thirsty, ready for a word of hope, dying on the vine without a word of hope. This, this picture, I hope, you're, I hope there's something shifting for you in the way you see the harvest field. That this is a harvest field that we don't even have to work at. Just All we have to do is show up at. It is so ripe that all we have to do is show up and give a word of hope. And some of you sitting here are, are, are folks who've responded to that hope. And I hope we're all folks who've responded to that hope. You and I for too long have thought it's, hard, it's a hard thing to enter the harvest field. We thought we had to work when we entered the harvest field. We thought the people in that harvest field didn't really want us there. We thought the people in that harvest field didn't really want to hear the good news. We thought the people in that harvest field would reject us and throw us out on our ear. But we have missed what Jesus said, that there is a field of people, human beings like you and me, who are dying to hear good news. Who are dying to hear good news. Dying to be encouraged, to be loved, to be prayed for, to be, to, to be given a word of hope, as John said, to be given just a word of peace. I have never in my life in 29 years at the college felt such a burden for my students as I do these days. And that burden just keeps growing. Last year, before COVID, and I think I shared this with you, but before COVID, I, I asked them, we started talking about how, they started talking with me about how depressed and anxious they feel most of the time. And we know that's true on college campuses. Anxiety and depression and suicide are levels that we've not seen before. And I, and I talked with them about that, and they said, well, there's so much going wrong in our world. And for many of them, they were born just after 9-11, or right around or before 9-11. And for them, that was a major marker. Even if they weren't born then, that 9-11 that kind of started the last 20 years for them. And it's been one thing after another that they talked about. And then COVID hit. And so I'm even more concerned about them, because many of them are even more isolated than they've ever been. Susan shared last week 
how concerned she is about our college students who are isolated in the rooms, isolated from one another. When I said to them, in fact, they, they offered to me that they said, when we greet each other and ask each other how you're doing, we say, I'm dead. I said, why do you say you're dead? They said, because that's the way we feel inside. Folks, that's a harvest field. This week I opened my college classes in prayer. I told them that if they, that I was going to pray a Christian prayer, I'm a Christian, I tell them that frequently. I tell them more so than I ever have. And if they didn't choose to pray with me, that was fine. I had no problem with that, but that I was going to offer a prayer for them. One of the things I've started saying to students who come into my office who are struggling, and I will say to them, one of the ways that I care for people is to pray with them. Are you okay with I, if I pray with you? And if they say no, that's perfectly fine with me. But I want them to know that my praying for them is not a judgment of who they are. It's just bringing them to God. It's a way of my caring for them. And you know what? 9.9 out, out of 10 times, they always say yes. Pray for me. And most of the time, they leave with tears in their eyes. Because I touched them? No, because Jesus touched them. Folks, that's what we have. We have the peace of Christ, the shalom of Christ in us. This is not rocket science. This is not hard. All we do is show up in town with peace. I think we've assumed also that the harvest field is a dangerous place. I mean, after all, Jesus said he's sending us out like lambs among wolves. Indeed, he did. But I'm not sure the wolves are in the harvest field. Or they are, I'm not sure the wolves, I don't think the wolves are those who, who are ripe for hearing the good news. I'm not sure sometimes those wolves might, be people, might not be other Christians who not, don't exactly like the way we're doing it in the harvest field, who think we ought to be working on the other side of the field when God has called us to this side. Maybe think our methods are out of touch with what God's doing. We ought to be using different tools. It's not clear who the wolves are in here. Let's not assume that it's the people out there. Let's not assume we're entering a world with news that's going to come back and bite us. I love what you said, Fred. We've lived with the sense that we have to be the quiet in the land for fear we'll get hurt like we did in Europe 500 years ago. We've got to be beyond that. There's too much good news. When, I go, but when we go back inside this church building, I hope we do not forget that the harvest field is a lot more exciting than we ever thought that it was. Jesus tells the disciples, the 72, when they get to these homes that they're going to, to look for someone who's a, and I looked at different versions of this, and it's really interesting, to look for someone who's a promoter of peace, a lover of peace, a son or daughter of peace. In other words, someone who carries peace in their hearts. Someone who carries kindness in their hearts. Someone who carries judge, not judgment in their hearts, but kindness and care and compassion and love in their hearts. What amazes me time and again is that so often I think that I have figured out it's at school, in my neighborhood, in our fam extended family, who the people of peace are and who they're not. I've got to figure it figured out. I know who the people of peace are and who they're not. And I will avoid the people who, who are not the people of peace and, and, and cultivate relationships with the people who are the people of peace. But I have been wrong time and time again. It's sometimes the people of peace who hurt me the most, and it's the people who I think don't have peace that show up at the end of the day as those with the greatest peace that they're carrying within themselves. People of peace cannot always be readily identified. People of peace cannot always be readily identified. Sometimes they are the last people we think they are. And I'm afraid that in our, that in our efforts to harvest, we too often want to harvest the people that look just like us. That we want to harvest the people that we feel safest with. Because we're afraid, again, of the wolves, and they must be wolves if they don't look like us. Think about that for a moment. We live with that thought. It's in the back of our heads. We carry it. We don't articulate it. But we want to be in a harvest field that looks like we do, that smells like we do, that tastes like we do. We want that harvest field. Jesus doesn't guarantee us that we're going to get that harvest field. If you think about this town around us, I noted last week, 
that the house across from the church has a Trump, make Trump, a, a Trump's a flag that says make America great again. They have another flag that says make liberals cry. At the corner of the street is a rainbow flag supporting LGBTQ individuals. I know this congregation well enough to know that some of you would find yourselves more comfortable knocking on one of those doors than the other. I just know that. Some of you feel more comfortable in the corner. Some of you feel more comfortable across the street. Because you would find more affinity with making liberals cry or with L supporting LGBTQ friends and concerns. But what if the line, what if the line that Jesus cares about is not between either of these houses? What if the line that Jesus most cares about is not between Democrat and Republican? What if the line that Jesus most cares about is not between conservative and Republican? What if the line that Jesus most cares about is who are people of peace and who are not? What if that's the line? What if that is the metric of our faithfulness? That means we show up to either door and we don't assume that the Trump folks aren't people of peace. And we don't assume that the LGBTQ people on the end of the street aren't people of peace. We don't know who the people of peace are. That's why we knock on the door. Jesus wouldn't have asked us to knock on the door if we knew. We don't know without knowing. We don't know without getting to know. We don't know without spending time with people. We don't know without loving them. What if the political party that Jesus is most concerned about is the kingdom party, the peace party, the shalom party? I'm not making any statement about who you vote for. That's, that's between you and God. I'm not touching that one. What I'm saying is no matter who you vote for, if you vote, are you first and foremost part of the kingdom party? Are you first and foremost part of the shalom party? Because I think Jesus would give both of these homes an opportunity to see if they're people of peace or not. I don't think he'd shy away from either of these homes. I am aware that there's deep concern among church leaders, including Mennonites, that this election in November could split our churches. Why? Because somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. And so many of us who claim to be followers of Jesus have identified that, or have argued or have articulated, whether we know it or not, that the primary measure of our Christian faithfulness is which candidate we support, and it is not. Our primary metric of Christian faithful, faithfulness is not measured by our political involvement. It's measured by do we take the peace of Christ to both of these homes? Do we cross party lines to extend the peace of Christ? And if we don't, we are not people of peace. And if we don't cross party lines to extend peace to others, then we ourselves need the peace of Christ. And it's no, it's, it's good, there's good reason the church has had such tr difficulty getting traction in its witness for Christ in this country because we have been so co-opted by both political parties. And we've missed the kingdom of God and what he calls us to. Because if Christian faithfulness is measured by who we vote for, it changes every four years. It changes with every election cycle. My question for you and for me is, after this election on November 4, on Wednesday, November 4, when we wake up, the day after the election, when we learn who is president, or eventually learn who is president, are we going to be people of peace? Are we going to measure and be measured by whether or not we say, I love you, I care about you, to whoever is in our office, in our family, in our neighborhood? Are we going to be people of peace? Because if we don't, the church will split. Maybe not this church, but other churches, right down the middle. Because we become so defined by this. Folks, I am calling us back to being defined by the kingdom of God and the peace of Christ, which is what this chapter is about. Jesus doesn't say, go to the door and see whether they appreciate Caesar or not or whether they're voting for the new Jewish zealot who's trying to overcome Caesar. That's, that's beyond Jesus' concern. 
Jesus' concern is, do you, are you bringing the kingdom of God to these people who are traumatized, hungry, thirsty, hurting, and wounded? In every political party, in every group of straight and gay folks, in every group of devout Christians, in every group of devout atheists, there are folks who reject God's peace, and there are folks who will accept it. They might not know yet what they're hungry for. And again, I love this way that song talked about it, we are hungry and thirsty for, for Christ. They might not be able to name the hunger and thirst that is in their heart. St. Augustine says, I am restless. I was restless until I found my rest in thee, O God. He tried everything else. Academics, sexual promiscuity, government. He tried everything else until he came to the point where he said, my heart, I learned, was restless until it found its rest in thee, O God. So they might not be able to name what they're hungry for, but what they're looking for is the shalom of Christ. Hungry for peace, dying for peace. And we are standing alongside the harvest field, worrying more about who is going to win in November than we are entering the harvest field and bringing this good news to our neighbors and family and friends. Folks, this is a tragedy. This is a tragedy. What if we were more concerned about not what these folks are flying in their neighborhoods, in our neighborhoods, but whether they know Jesus or not, whether they've been introduced to Jesus or not. What strikes me also about this passage is that verse 6, Jesus goes on to say that if anyone is in that house who is a person of peace, your peace will rest on them. You see, my experience is frequently among students and neighbors and people in our extended family, and I've mentioned them if you listen to any of my podcast episodes. My father-in-law, Mark Warren, others who were just waiting to be offered peace, who were just waiting to be offered hope. They might not know yet what they're looking for, but the seeds of peace are planted within them. They are people with God's imprint made in the image of God. So why would the seeds of peace not be implanted within them? And when you and I are truly people of God's peace and get near them, those seeds awaken. That's the wonderful thing. When we get near them and we are people of peace, carrying Christ's peace within us, they are aware of Christ's voice. And they hearken to that voice and they awaken to that voice. And they say to themselves in their heart and soul, says, that's it. That's what I've been hungry for. That's what I've been thirsty for. That's what I've been longing for. That's the peace. That's what I've been restless for. There it is. I don't know what it is, and I don't know how to name it. But you will find that sometimes those folks will just tag along with you. They might call you. They might text you. They might spend time with you. They might know you not yet what they're up to. But you will walk them into the kingdom of God by continuing to extend the peace of God to them. It happens. And it's not that complicated. If you have the peace of Christ in you, you carry that peace to whomever and wherever you go. I believe that it's possible for the presence of Christ in our lives to, over time, cause the people we walk with to just walk into the kingdom before they even know it's happened. They've just walked with us into the kingdom before they know it's happened. They've been absorbed by the love and peace of Christ who lives within us and who gave his life for them. And that's the next to final lesson as I wrap up that I hope and pray we never forget when we go back inside the doors of this church. That the people of peace we are looking for are generally out here and not in there. The people of peace who need this word are generally out here and not in there. And as God told the exiles in Jeremiah 29, that if they were bearers of peace, people known as ones who shared the peace with their enemies in Babylon, that peace would come back to them. That peace will come back, not as we gather in a building, but as we leave the building. That peace will come to us as we extend Christ's peace to this community and our families and our friends and our neighbors. The last thing I hope we've learned from this passage is that Jesus says don't move from town to town or house to house 
because nurturing the seeds of peace in folks takes a long, long time sometimes. Some of you have walked with people who you got really frustrated with, who you, you sensed were people of peace, who were ready to commit to Jesus to hear the good news of the gospel, but the walk with them was like this. And sometimes it was two steps back and one step forward. I think there's good reason that Jesus says, don't rush this thing. Don't rush this thing. Stay in the house. Stay in the town. Spend perhaps your lifetime with this individual, nurturing the peace that is within them. Our most important metric this year, this November, and always, is whether we carry within us the peace of Christ or not. Not whether it's rejected or accepted, but whether we carry it. That's all he's asked us to do. I've said repeatedly, I think his last words to us will be when we, first words to us will be when we show up at the kingdom's gates. How did you do with the mission? Because when he leaves us, that's what he leaves us with. Every, every passage about his ascension is a passage about going, you are sent on a mission and lo, I'm with you always to the end of the world. So when we get up there, I don't think he's going to say, how are you doing? I think he's going to say, how did you do with my mission? How did you spend your time in the harvest field? What did you do in that space and in that place? Sometimes we wipe the, sh the dust off our feet way too quickly. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning. And we thank you that you are the Prince of Peace. We thank you that you extend your love and your grace to a world that is lost, dying, an incredible need of you. We pray as we've heard your word, as we absorb your word, that you would empower us, encourage us, invite us again into this harvest field with those that you so loved and so love still. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together again if you're able uh, to sing a response song.
Hi everyone, I have a quick announcement to make about WOW. Uh, you know, it's been so interesting to see all that God is doing and how he is orchestrating just this incredible symphony. Um, you have all these different ministers who are looking and evaluating what God is laying on their hearts and many of us aren't having an opportunity to tell one another our stories and yet we're just seeing how God is weaving it all together and it's just pretty amazing to watch the miracles unfold in front of us. So as well was the committee was thinking and evaluating what our group would look like this year, we just really started to get the sense that God was asking us to um, evaluate building on last year's um, momentum of small group discussions during our large gatherings to take those and bring them into a whole new light and allow us to meet in small groups in individual homes, creating more of that intimacy um, and opportunity for women to really be real with one another and authentic and share their stories with one another in um, individual homes. And so we are going to have a wow kickoff here. It is the women of the word. So women from ages 18 and up are invited to just come and sit in the presence of the Lord. The kickoff will be in our parking lot. So it's going to look a little bit differently than it has before, but you know what? It's so exciting to watch what he's unfolding for us. So it'll be 6 o'clock on Tuesday, December. December. We will not be sitting outside in December. We'll probably go inside for that. September 15th, um, Tuesday evening from 6 to 7.30, we're going to meet together in small roundtable groups where you will sign up to be a part of um, home groups that will meet then throughout most of the year um, and we'll tell you a little bit more about those logistics as they um, unfold in front of us on Tuesday but Laura uh, Risser has been sending out announcements so if you would like to be a part of that women's ministry and you haven't received information just let us know we'd love to get you on the mailing list but I think um, it was so exciting when Laura sat um, in our last meeting and said this completely folded together with what Kendra and Jeff had shared um, during their message the other week. And so we really see God moving and we hope you'll join us. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. That is very exciting. Let's stand together. I just want to also commend you as a congregation for the way you've really practiced socially distancing. The board was, has taken very seriously its role in uh, the way we live together. I want to thank you for practicing kindness, practicing kindness with one another, and uh, taking care of one another. Lord Jesus, you know the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. And we know that this moment we live in is but a blip in eternity. Thank you for our salvation that we found in you. Thank you that we have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Thank you that there is no shame or condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And thank you that you work all things together for good to those who love you. Thank you that your love is wider and broader and deeper and higher than we have any idea. Thank you for your compassion. Bless these people, these brothers and sisters this day with your people, your peace as people of peace as we bring that peace to those around us this week. In Jesus' name, amen. I do want to say next Sunday will be Children's Sunday. It, was not, it did not work for Bethany to be here or for Jess and Andy to be here for the youth. So next Sunday will be Children and Youth Sunday, at, back to school Sunday uh, to celebrate and pray for our children, youth, and teachers, whether it's back to school at home or whether it's back to school uh, in a building. Thank you.